introduce Dr. Andrew Wakefield. Um, Andrew, you're um, involved with the MMO and the vaccines and you've been controversial with that. Um, do you want to kind of we go pedal back a bit and talk about how it all came about? Yeah, sure. I, I got involved in my research is Crohn's disease. I was a, a mainstream academic gastroenterologist looking at the origins of Crohn's disease, an infectious basis for that disease, and um, the, the idea developed over many years that it was related to measles. And there are reasons for that I don't need to go into. It's a long history. But the question, the key question was, why are we seeing Crohn's disease in children who've never had typical measles? If measles is linked to Crohn's, why are we seeing an explosion of this disease in children? It was never seen before the mid-60s in the UK in children. It was unheard of, and then suddenly we saw it emerging. So I got into that area, and I published a paper in The Lancet in 1995 suggesting that there may be a link between measles and Crohn's disease. On the back of that paper, parents started calling me and saying, my child was perfectly normal. They had their MMR vaccine, their measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, and then they lost all their skills. They lost their speech communication, they couldn't engage with their siblings, they lost eye contact, and they were eventually diagnosed with autism. And I said, listen, I know nothing about autism. I'm a gastroenterologist, have you got the right number? Have you got the right extension? They said, yes, because my kid has got terrible bowel problems. Diarrhea 10, 12 times a day, pain, bloating, um, they're losing weight, they're failing to thrive. And to a gastroenterologist, those are key signs of an underlying gastrointestinal disease. So that was the beginning of a very interesting journey. Okay, and what made you kind of step out from the crowd when you did find out, when you, when you did all the research that you needed to do, and you thought, this is where the problem is, well, what we're being told is, is, is wrong. What made you step out away from, because obviously, you know, you obviously had a job and you were getting paid, and. You know, um, a lot of people will just say, I'm not saying anything because I have a family and I have the mortgage and everything else. What made you step out? Well, it's a question of why you sign up to do medicine in the first place. You know, I um, here is a mother with a child who they need answers. And my job is, to the best of my ability, to try and give them those answers, not to run away from the question because it's uncomfortable for me. And as you say, many doctors would say, listen, I know what you're saying is right or maybe right but actually this is going to cause me problems so go and find another doctor and that's just not the way I was raised in medicine it doesn't make me clever or brave it's just mm. that my duty of care is to the patient and medicine begins and ends with the patient and that's it okay um did you talk to your colleagues before that before did you say to them by the way I found this I'm going to or you know I'm going to release this in the general public, or did they tell you, don't do that because you won't be helped? Well, there were 13 of us on the team looking at this, and we, there was a clear and obvious association with the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, and the professor of, uh, of paediatric gastroenterology gave a presentation on the first six or seven cases that we saw, saying explicitly this came on after MMR vaccination. So it wasn't that we were on a different page at all, we were all the co-authors of that original Lancet paper all felt uh, much the same way. And the question is how, was, how do you deal with it? And my feeling was, look, here's a story, it's coherent, it makes sense. The parents, you know, repeat whatever, they, you know, they, they all, they're all saying the same thing. So we need to report that. And my colleagues then got a little, you know, a little bit cold feet and said, well, we can't be seen to question the safety of the MMR vaccine. Or, that didn't make a lot of sense, because if it was chicken pox, we'd report it, so why not the vaccine? It didn't make a lot of sense to me. It's like saying we can't question the safety of thalidomide. Well, no, that wouldn't make sense either. So mm. we went ahead and published it, and of course that's when <laughs> everything hit the fan, as you say. You know. Okay, and you said you had 13 colleagues there. I mean, why did you stand out among them, amongst them to, just to talk about this, and did they kind of step back and... It wasn't the fact you stepped forward, you stepped, they stepped back and they left you there, or did you ask them to back you up at this and they just said, well, we're not going to get involved? No, Why only you? you? The difference of opinion came on, not on reporting the Vaccine Association, but what you do about it. Mm -hmm. So I'd done a lot of research, published, I got written a 150-page report on the safety studies of MMR vaccine, and they were derisory, they were terrible, and um, I was particularly concerned I could my kids this vaccine. So 
here was a real problem. When the question, when the, the inevitable question was going to be asked by the media or by a parent, saying, what would you do next? What should I do for my child? Or what would you recommend for children? And um, we can't dodge that question. And I'd done this background research. I wrote to my colleagues and I said, listen, this paper's going to come out. It's going to attract attention. The media are going to be involved. It's going to be a press briefing. And inevitably, someone's going to say, what would you do next? What would you recommend? Mm -hmm. Would you give your kid MMR? Yeah. And I said, I can't support, I can no longer support MMR vaccination because the safety studies are not there. Yeah. I will continue to support the, the use of the single vaccines, but I can't support the triple vaccine. I know there will be a difference of opinion on this, yeah. but I've got to write to you in advance and tell you what my position is. Yeah. And they wrote back and said, oh, we understand, that's your position, this is our position. And the dean of the medical school ran the media committee. And the media committee, he had decided to have a press briefing. Mm. And he had three options here. He could have said, no press briefing, because I don't want to get the school, medical school to get into this controversy, or Wakefield, you're banned from the press briefing, so that you can't answer that question if it's asked. Or, when the question is asked, then I'll direct it to someone else. Mm. I'll direct it to one of the pediatricians, mm. but not to you. So three options. What did he do? When the question was asked, as it was always going to be asked, mm -hmm. he sent the question, he passed, as the chairman of that meeting, he passed the question straight to me. Andy, what would you do? And then I gave the answer that I said I was going to give in writing to him a month in advance mm -hmm. of publication. So there were no surprises. Mm -hmm. And yet the fallout from that was him saying, oh, I never knew never knew what he was going to say. He had it in writing. It was there in front of him. It was adduced in evidence of the mm. GMC, but he denied it. I remember, I remember the whole um, the episode of that, because I was living in the UK at the time. <clears throat> what do you think is behind the, the MMR vaccine? You know, what, who's behind it? Why, why is there such a controversy with the MMR? Do you feel that there's some sinister means behind the MMR jab? Like there's a government conspiracy or something like that behind it? Well, what happened, and this is all described in my book, is that I became involved in the MMR litigation. So I was approached by a lawyer who said, we're seeing all these children with these problems. Will you help us determine whether there is or is not a case in law against the manufacturers of the vaccine? And I felt I had an obligation. Here we were seeing all these children. They had a lifelong disease. There was no compensation for them at the moment. They, when their parents died, what was going to happen? Mm. There was no way for them to go. They were going to die on the street. Uh, it was a tragedy. So I said, yes, I have an obligation professionally, morally, to, to, to help out with this. Um, medical experts testify all the time, for and against. And that's what my, my part of my job was. So um, as I got involved in that, we thought we were involved in a case against the vaccine manufacturers. Now, when MMR vaccine was introduced in the UK, three brands were introduced, uh, one made by Ventus Pastor Maria, one by Smith Klein Beecham, one by Merck. Two of those contained a mump strain which was known to be a problem. It's called Urabi AM9. It was causing meningitis in children in Canada. It was withdrawn in Canada in the same month that it was licensed in England. Extraordinary situation. Here you've got it being withdrawn in one major country and licensed in the same month in another country. So they sent a guy over from Canada senior member of the Department of Health, to advise on the introduction of this vaccine. He said, don't do it. Don't do it. We're having problems. You've seen the problems we're having. It's not safe. Don't do it. They decided to do it. They just did it because it was, why did they do it? Because it was cheaper? Because it was the home team, Smith Klein Beecham, not Merck or a French company? I don't know. But they gave the contract, the majority of the contract for MMR to Smith Klein Beecham. I think they had 85% of the, of the contract for supplying MMR despite the fact that he told them not to do it. Well, they introduced it, and four years later, inevitably, it was causing meningitis at a vastly higher rate than they expected, and they had to withdraw it. Now, why would they do that? Why would a company introduce a vaccine which they knew was going to cause them problems and therefore potential liability down the line? Well, it appears from the expert, from the, uh, the whistleblower in this case, uh, Dr. Alistair Torres from Scotland, that they'd done a deal with the government. The drug company had done a deal with the government where the government had assumed their liability, had taken on their liability for damage from that vaccine. And the comment in the book is, is that the someone from the 
vaccine manufacturers said to Dr. Torres, we are immunising the children and the government is immunising us. So that was really what it was about. It was about a deal done between the drug company and the British government that uh, led to the introduction of a vaccine which was unsafe, was proven to be unsafe, had to be withdrawn, and he said, I'm sure there were, I know there were many, many children who were damaged, they'll never receive compensation. Do you believe that they were putting profit over people? Yes, I do. I think they were, well, they were putting costs. That was a cheaper vaccine. So I think the British government was saying this is cheaper, home team, I don't know. This is a question that really, really needs to be put to uh, David Salisbury, who's in charge of immunisation in the UK. Mm. Why did you make this decision? What was the basis for putting the cost of a vaccine before the health of children? Okay, we're not getting too technical. Can you tell us the difference between a child who is autism, born with autism, and a child who got autism through the MMR jab? Yes, I can. I mean, what happens historically, autism is described in children who were never right from the beginning. They never cried, they never want to be picked up, they never put their arms out um, for their mother to pick them up. They were described as very easy children in many cases. They never engaged in eye contact, they never spoke, they never um, communicated with their siblings. That was the sort of classic feature of autism, this aloofness, this distant aloofness. Now, that's not what we were seeing. We were seeing children who were developing normally, 15, 18 months, and then they got their jab or they got an infection, and then they crashed, they went downhill. Mm -hmm. So they had skills, mm -hmm. they had speech, language, interaction, eye contact, that were lost. So it was quite clear to the parents what would happen. They had a normal child and they lost them. Mm -hmm. They described it as the lights going out. The lights in this child went out. And so this story was repeated time and time and time again. So here we had what was historically an extremely rare form of autism now presenting on a regular basis with these gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, what's happening today since, you know, you came out on the scene and you told people what was going on, we had all the controversy, is that MMR job still being given out today? It's still being given, well, why? Um, a lot has moved on, we've changed the whole landscape since uh, 15 years ago, you know, it's um, now there's an epidemic that's recognised, it's not genetic, it's environmental, it's some toxic environmental effect. Regression is much more common and it's accepted, and um, fortunately, recovery is now possible. And most recently, an analysis of children who've been compensated in America in the vaccine, vaccine injury compensation program shown a clear association between vaccines and autism. Not just MMR, but vaccines and autism. So here you have a situation where the British, sorry, the American government has been compensating for these cases where brain damage leads to autism and on the one hand paying out for these cases and on the other hand denying that they ever occurred. So, so the people watching this interview now, if they said that they brought their child down to the doctor to get an MMR jab, which you're saying, saying is that's still going on, 